Imagine that every time you go to the doctor, you get a small finger prick, and that resultant tiny droplet of blood is used to make 50 measurements in about 10 to 15 minutes, and the information is added to your digital health record. Now, this could become an invaluable asset to help, to help track your health and improve your health over time. So, for example, it could be used to detect disease processes before they become serious, such as cancer, when they're still very treatable. In essence, this measurement capability is the holy grail of diagnostic and preventative medicine. There's only one problem with this scenario, however, and that is that this device does not exist. And this illustrates a profound truth about technology and how it intersects our lives. And that is that what we can do in technology is defined by our tools. And if we want new capabilities, new possibilities, we need to create new tools. And what I'd like to talk with you about today is share my experience in developing a new tool to give us a new capability that has the potential to make this type of diagnostic device that we've just imagined a reality. Now, to illustrate the problem to be solved, envision walking into a medical diagnostic lab such as this one at our local hospital. And you take this lab and shrink it down to a tiny chip. This is the scientific field of lab on a chip. With the lab on a chip field, the whole point is to make microfluidic devices in which we can make take tiny sample volumes, like a, t a small pr uh, prick of a blood, finger prick of blood, and do a biochemical analysis to get whatever information it is that we're looking for uh, from that sample. And as you'd guess from the term microfluidic, micro indicates small. How small? Well, individual features on these microfluidic devices need to be about 100 microns or less. Now, I know you're probably saying to yourself, what is a micron? It's not a unit that we typically use every day. So let me, uh, let me just tell you, it's one one thousandth of a millimeter. Now again, you're probably saying, mm, that's really not doing it for me. Okay, a millimeter, how big is that? Well, that is the size of a poppy seed like you would have on a poppy seed um, a muffin. And so that's the black object in the center here. Next to, on the left, a small kernel of uh, brown rice, and on the right, a human hair. So 100 microns, then, is 100 thousandths of a um, millimeter, or in other words, easier to understand, it's just the diameter of a human hair. So that's about the size of the features we need to be able to create for microfluidic devices. So what exactly are these features that need to be so small in a microfluidic device? Well, you can think of such device as kind of like a building with hallways and rooms, and it's made out of a transparent plastic and, of course, is very small. Now, the purpose of the hallways, uh, they're basically these small hair-sized uh, little channels through, its, through which fluids flow to the rooms. And in the rooms, uh, those are tiny chambers in which we do biochemical processes and analyses to extract the information we're looking for from the sample. Now, we won't discuss what goes on in these rooms to get that information. Instead, let's talk about how you make the tiny little structures in the first place, because after all, you need to be able to make the structures, make a microfluidic device in order to use it. So how are microfluidic devices normally made? Well, usually, they're fabricated in a clean room, one of those rooms where uh, people run around in bunny suits, such as the uh, BYU clean room that's shown here. Now, clean rooms are used to make very tiny structures on things like silicon chips and all kinds of other sorts of devices. And they're very expensive to set up and to operate. But once you have a clean room, then you can make microfluidic devices. And how you make them is you basically create individual layers with some kind of uh, surface features and maybe some holes. And then you take those and you stack them up, align them just so, bond them together, and then you have a completed device. Now, I have to confess, this is a very slow and cumbersome process and can be quite error prone. In my university research group, we've made many types of microfluidic devices uh, over the years and associated biosensors. So, for example, uh, the object on the right here is a microfluidic device integrated on top of a silicon biosensor. And it took a really long time to make these things, all of which we did in the BYU clean room. Uh, the microfluidic part took months, and the silicon part took literally years. 
in the process of developing this device and many others, I found myself with a growing sense of frustration at how long it took to do the microfluidic piece. You know, if you're lucky, you could get it done in weeks. If you're not so lucky, it would take months. And too often, it just never happened because it was just too hard. So instead, I wanted to find a way to make these kinds of devices that would do it in, say, a few hours or a few days at most. So in late 2012, I started to think about 3D printing as a possible method of doing this kind of fabrication. And of course, if you could get 3D printing to work, then you get rid of the whole clean room, so you, you eliminate that whole expense, which means many more people can engage in the process of microfluidic device development. Let's think about what a microfluidic, or rather, what a 3D printer needs to do. Fundamentally, in the simplest possible terms, uh, it, you need to be able to take a liquid precursor material, like this yellowish liquid in this little tray, and turn it into, using your 3D printer, some kind of a solid device with all kinds of structures in it. So that's really the purpose of the 3D printer. And we're not going to talk about exactly how that's done. Instead, what we want to focus on is what kind of structures we need that 3D printer to make in this solidified plastic part in the end. And we'll start with the simplest possible feature you can make, and that is a, a fluid channel, which is, in essence, the hallway in our uh, building analogy. And we want to be able to make these as small as possible so we can make our devices small. So to get an idea of what 3D printers could do, I created a simple design, sent it off to a bunch of service bureaus, and asked them to use the highest and most highest resolution, best 3D printers and materials that they could do, and then we would evaluate the result. And what we got back was something like this. This is a 500 by 500 micron channel, i.e. 25 times bigger than a human hair, and the results are pretty sad, except the one on the right. That actually looks pretty good. But as you decrease the size of the channel, things just get progressively worse until it's just not doable. So the bottom line is that commercial 3D printers just cannot do the job required to make microfluidic devices. And of course, this is not very surprising because such printers were designed for other types of applications at which they're very good. It's just not, not this application. So at this point, I saw that our only option was to build our own 3D printer. In other words, create a new tool so that we would have new possibilities. And after a lot of planning, fundraising, designing, building, struggling, the usual sort of thing, this is the 3D printer that we came up with. And next to it is standing my graduate student, Hua Gong, who was intimately involved in making the printer. And he's there to give a sense of scale and, of course, also to subtly give him some kudos because of the great job he did. <laughs> now, to use this new tool, to make lab-on-a-chip devices for healthcare and other applications, we first need to be able to make fundamental building block structures uh, from which all such microfluidic devices are um, made out of. And we're still in the early stages of doing this, but what I'd like to do is show you some of what we've accomplished so you get a sense of where we're at. And we'll start with small channels. And so in this schematic drawing on the left is the size of a channel about the size of a human hair. And on the right is the size of a channel that we can now make with our 3D printer. And here is a scanning electron microscope image of um, an actual 3D printed channel. And the beautiful thing here is this is now 25 times smaller than a human hair. So the size is absolutely awesome. It is just outstanding how small we can make these things. Now, just like in a building, you need doors to separate various rooms and hallways from each other. In a microfluidic device, you need the equivalent in order to be able to send fluids where you need them to go, when you need them to go there. And of course, these structures we call valves. And we could talk about how they're designed, but in essence, we have a cylindrical uh, region that's separated into two parts by a thin membrane. It's all just 3D printed as part of the same print. And the lower part um, is for fluids. The upper part we can pressurize such that we can bend that membrane and close off the two channels in the bottom part, thereby closing the valve, or we can release the pressure, have that membrane spring back up, and then the valve is open. So <clears throat> in 2011, we first made valves of this type using a clean room process, and the same kind of material we use now in our 3D printer, and the smallest we could get was about 700 microns, which was 
eh, okay, but not very exciting. In 2015, we got our first 3D printer. The smallest valve we could make was two millimeters in diameter, which is just absolutely huge. I mean, this is just way beyond where we want to be. The next year, we got another 3D printer, and we were able to decrease the size down to a little over a millimeter, but still, this is big, and, you know, not terribly exciting. And last year, when we finished making our own 3D printer, we could easily get 300 micron diameter valves, and over the last month, we've actually got this down to 150 microns. So now it's totally awesome in terms of how small we can make these things. So for example, here's a 300 micron valve and a 150 micron valve with a red fluid in the fluid regions, just so you can kind of visualize it. And this is what they look like when they're closed, when that membrane is, um, is depressed. And basically, these things work awesome. You know, here's 45 valves just arranged in a simple test array. And uh, we've gone up to a million actuations, i.e. on off, they still work just fine, so they're very robust. So once we have valves, then it's pretty straightforward to make pumps. So here's an example of a pump, and it's that uh, little thing on the, on the left that's kind of bopping around, and you can see the red fluid getting pushed through the serpentine channel there, and all of this is 3D printed, very tiny. Uh, now, once we have um, uh, small channels, valves, pumps, then we're all set to be able to make uh, other little or more sophisticated subcomponents that you need to be able to make uh, microfluidic devices that have a lot of capability. So for example, when you're monitoring, uh, say, diabetes, you need to measure blood sugar, and often those measurement techniques, you need to dilute the sample. So we designed, or rather, we designed a, uh, a system uh, that would do an arbitrary dilution, i.e. you can select what you want. Also does all the mixing and the pumping and everything else. And we won't go through the block diagram, but I want to show you the 3D CAD drawing. And um, when you look at that, it seems to be quite complicated. And of course, that's because it is. It's a pretty complicated little thing. <laughs> and the interesting thing is you could never make this in a clean room. But with 3D printing, complexity is basically free. In other words, it doesn't take any longer to make something complex as it does something simple. And so here we have this thing actually fabricated in operation. We've got a little pump pumping some red fluids, a little pump pumping some uh, clear fluid. It goes into that big circular region, which is the mixer. And it's kind of like after your workout when you shake up the protein drink. That's basically what the mixer does, except on a very tiny scale. And then it pumps it out the, uh, the outlet channel. And the beautiful thing about this is the size of it is essentially the size of a sesame seed. And so what we've done, just for fun, is shown that you can make a lot of these things at once. So here's 60 of these little uh, mixer pumps uh, printed in one print run, which takes only 30 minutes. And the interesting thing about this is it suggests that you could actually use this type of 3D printing for manufacturing in addition to prototyping, but that's actually a story for another time. So in summary, what we've done is taken this clean room, slow method of making microfluidic devices and turned it into a little small, in comparison, uh, 3D printer that eliminates the huge cost of the clean room and allows you to make prints very quickly. We routinely do things in you know, maybe 30 minutes, 20 minutes, 40 minutes, depending upon the device. And, um, and we can make very complex devices because it doesn't take any longer to do that. So ultimately, what we're doing is summed up in this quote by Steve Jobs. What's important is that you have faith in people, that they're basically good and smart, and if you give them tools, they'll do wonderful things with them. We are really excited to see the wonderful things that people will do with the new tool that we've created. Thank you very much.